Hello and good morning everyone. I'm very much looking forward to present this session on performance management and planning with Power BI in um, our home city in Sydney after doing the sessions in a few cities in Asia Pacific. Um, so initially just a few words um, about myself. I'm the Managing Director of Managility. We're a specialist provider for Microsoft Business Intelligence Solutions and Power Apps. Um, we focus, um, we've been focusing on Power BI since the start. We have at the moment um, eight showcases in the partner showcase for a wide variety of um, industries and, and, and application areas. I'm personally based in the most eastern part of Australia, which I guess most of you are familiar with um, in a place called Byron Bay. What we can see here in this video is one of our local beaches with three of my four girls. The cat doesn't like the beach too much, so she's not here, but the my three girls um, are, are here um, in, in the video. It's a bit of a drone flight um, over our beaches. Um, we also have um, some Power BI add-on products. One is the Acarius Matrix Lite, a free visual that's available in the App Store. And then we have a premium version called Actaris that covers um, data warehouse automation to accounting systems, um, enables business users to model and build um, new um, models for specific business application areas. And then also um, offers write back and planning from Power BI, so you just can write back directly from Power BI, um, but also from a few other solutions, like for example Excel. So, um, what's our topic today? We will be covering enterprise performance management and planning. And many people think Power BI is a great data visualization tool, but what I will be showing you today is that you can take it much further and use it as a platform for comprehensive performance management and planning um, applications. And I will show you how to realize this. Initially, we'll be looking at data modeling considerations to build um, related models. We'll be looking at visualization best practice here to use in the performance management and planning context. And then we look at how to realize specific requirements from tracking KPIs and variances to financial statements and then um, also um, a strong focus on data collection with Power Apps, Microsoft Flow and the Actaris visuals. So what is performance management? Um, just a quick introduction to performance management in our definition is a feedback cycle that covers initially setting the strategy, planning, putting together an operational plan, monitoring this plan, and then steering in case there are variances to the plan. Um, the process typically involves a, a wide variety of data sources. This could be ERP systems, other internal sources, but also external services. These are then typically accessed using a analytic data model, but um, there is also the option to access them directly in, in Power BI. On top of this, what is a great option um, to use um, performance management with is Microsoft Teams. Um, for example, our company runs now entirely on Microsoft Teams. Um, we're using it for everything related to our projects. Um, from initially uh, scope and wiki, so the ongoing knowledge management, to file management, um, task management, but then also um, to run Power BI reports. And I will show you, you, you can run your Power BI reports, for example, that contain your performance management or planning systems directly from Microsoft Teams. Um, the components that are typically involved in the performance management context are obviously Power BI, which we'll be covering. Then um, we'll show you a little bit what Actaris adds here. 
So from a write back perspective and um, modeling perspective and, and data warehouse automation, we'll look at power apps. How can you integrate power apps to cover particular areas of performance management and planning? There is of course Excel as well for flexible reporting requirements, but also write back as we will see and Microsoft Flow to cover workflows. So initially let's look at what is the performance management process built on. So that's typically the data model. And with the data model, we recommend the typical requirements. So we recommend the typical approach and that is using a narrow fact table. So not too many fields and one value field, which we also see here, we have one value field and then a few um, dimensions here. But then the details of time periods, organization, cost centers, scenarios, and accounts is in the dimension tables or so data tables, as they're called, where you then have all the detailed fields for uh, time aggregations, for cost center details, organizational details, account details, and so on. So this is typically the, the data model that performance management is realized with. So important here is that you typically aim to have one value column that actually contains your data and then also break this down or use scenarios here that specify what is this value. Is this an actual value? Is this a budget value? Is this a forecast value? But as much as you can, everything in one table, you typically have to integrate different data sources for this um, or append different data sources. So this is typically all done in the modeling process. If you use solutions like Actaris, that is done completely automatically. But of course, you cannot do this all manually um, using the normal Power BI functionality. Um, the next aspect, and we won't go into too much detail, I will just cover the, the typical requirements. The DAX is, is standard here, and, and if you're interested, just um, you can go to our blog or, or look up um, the typical calculations at the, the gurus uh, in the space, like, uh, like Marco Russo. Um, and, and all the other experts that are covering DAX. Just um, to quickly cover it, what are the typical calculations that are necessary? You have absolute variances that um, show you the, the difference between actuals and comparison values, so the full absolute difference in number. Then you have relative variances that show you the relative degree um, of the difference between actual and target. Um, one thing that's typically quite helpful in a performance management context is to have relative benchmarks. And, and this is, for example, percentage of sales. So you show all your data of your financial statement, for example, all your, your cost items as a percentage of sales. So marketing cost was 20% of sales. Um, SG&A was 10% of sales. And then this gives you the option to compare even different industries um, against um, your own. Um, to see how you're doing and it's not that relevant um, what the absolute value is but you can see I'm spending 20% of my revenues on marketing but my competition is spending 30% so they spend much more. So that's typically um, an important consideration. Um, the next one is uh, balance measures. So by default um, you typically use um, additive measures but in the performance management context in particular for balance sheets you're not looking at um, a particular movement um, in, in a time period, but you look at the movement over time. So you look at the total from, the, from a particular point in start point to now. And then it's, if you're using these, these balances and you have to be careful how you treat them. So you, you can't, for example, just add, add them up because they are, they are balances that um, are calculated over um, a, a time period and you can't just um, add them up. Like for example, the balance for January and the balance for um, February and March, you can't just add them up to your, your first quarter. You have to treat them properly and, and get 
the, the balance at the end of the, of the period. Um, another typical calculation is financial statement subtotals like um, gross margin, EBIT, EBITDA and so on. Um, so this is typically done using running totals where you calculate your financial statement positions and aggregate them up until a particular point where you want to see a subtotal and this is something that we'll cover in the session today and the key uh, part here are the, the running totals that um, are then making up these, these subtotals. And then um, obviously another one is ratios. So ratios um, that show you um, important um, aspects of, of your business. For example, this could be profitability ratios, this could be ratios that com um, compare your assets against your debts and many, many others. Um, so this was um, just an overview of typical calculations in the process. The next one, the next topic that I would like to cover is visualizations, which is um, a strong focus for us at Managerality to um, help our clients to use the right tools to communicate their information and, and communicate in a consistent way with the aim to be uh, to communicate so that it is understood at a glance. And um, there's a, a ver wide variety of, there's a few experts out there that um, have researched this topic. Um, people like um, Tufti, Stephen Few, and um, a professor from Germany, Professor Hichert. Um, and um, he has done a great, um, great job around um, data visualization. And he has developed the success principles. And I would like to quickly cover the, the key aspects of these success principles. So this, these are principles that are um, put together in a standard called IBCS, International Business Communication Standards. So if you're interested and want to know more about it, you can go to the website ibcs.com and look up the and look up further information for these standards. So I would like to cover the the key principles here and the first one is say it so um, what he here is postulating here that when you're using a chart when you're using a dashboard um, it is important to consider the message of this dashboard um, it's not so relevant in a performance management co context where you have standardized information but when you preparing a report for your management they should see that um, you have um, thought about um, the, the chart here and it's not not just um, a way to graphically show the obvious so he's saying um, really only use a chart if you have an interesting message if, the, if, 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 if you haven't got anything interesting to say then better leave it out and I will cover a little bit later on some details around this the next topic the next principle is unify and, and that's really a very crucial um, aspect in, in our opinion for proper data visualization so that you are consistent so that your users know at a glance um, when you're using a particular chart type when you're using a particular color um, when you're using a um, particular way to show your charts that um, you are consistent so for example um, when you're using your own financial data, it's green. Um, when the data is related to sales, it has another color. When it's a relative figure, you're using a dotted line. When it's a um, when it's um, a full value, you're using um, a solid line and so on. So just to be consistent and again we'll cover this a little bit later on in, with some more details. Um, condense is um, a principle that all these um, information design experts postulate where 
the, the focus is on increasing information density. So everything that is not related uh, to what you want to communicate is better left out. So, so don't embellish your data, don't have things on your report that have nothing to do um, with your data and just um, distract the viewer. So really make sure you're, you're increasing the information density, you're separating the signal from the noise. So you're minimizing noise as much as you can. Um, one important um, aspect in this principle is small multiples so that you ensure um, you allow the users to see things in context. So to have uh, a fairly large number of related results on, on a dashboard so that um, the users get a bit of an overview of the context as opposed to just one item uh, where I can see, okay, this is how my revenue uh, developed, but I don't see anything else. As a, and with the small multiples, um, for example, you're showing a particular result for a wide variety of, of for um, a larger number of items. So I show this revenue now for all my business units on one, on one um, report. Check um, is Another important principle to ensure that what you're communicating is really correct. And I will cover you know, a variety of typical errors in this space. Express is um, the fifth principle that is focused on using the right information sorry, the right visualization type for the information at hand. So, um, one thing, for example, that Richard suggests here is that the, the layout of your chart, for example, if it's displayed horizontally or vertically, is based on the type. So, um, for example, what he suggests is when you're having time periods, you're using a horizontal display, and when you have something else, like for example, product results, you're using a vertical display. Simplify is similar to the condense, so to minimize the ink to data ratio. And um, So, um, here I would like to give you a quick overview of the My next topic is visualization principles and um, this topic is focused on conveying data as effectively as possible. So to enable your users to understand what you want to communicate at a glance the quickest possible way. And, and this, um, around this topic, there has been a fair bit um, of research um, of people like Edward Tufte, Stephen Few, um, but also a professor from Germany, uh, Rolf Hichert, who has been the the main um, who has developed the IBCS principles and IBCS stands for International Business Communication Standards and it is guidelines, IBCS are guidelines on how you communicate business information effectively and if you're interested you can um, look up further details at um, the IBCS website, ibcs.com. So I would like to quickly now cover what are the, the seven key principles. And one of the 
uh, first principles is say it and say it is focused on that when you're having a when you're using a chart um, you should ensure that you actually have something to say for example if we look at this chart here we see now the revenue over time which you know, gives you a bit of an inter of, a, of an insight of how revenue has developed but not much else and so what he had is suggesting here that when you're communicating with a chart you really should make sure you have a message and so as, a, as opposed to just throwing the user throwing to the user uh, you know a few bar charts you show that you really have thought about the uh, about this development there and have got, have got something interesting to say. So for example here as opposed to the previous one we're saying considering inflation and currency effects we have projected the worst result for XYZ in corporate history for 2003. And we've considered currency effect, we've considered inflation effects and we're seeing that actually the bars as they came out initially out of our software didn't really give us the, the right details because as we're seeing, um, our results weren't actually that great. So this was um, Say It. The next one is Unify. So what he here postulates is to be consistent in your visualization. So um, dashboards and charts are not a way for the CFO to outlive their artistic um, inspirations, aspirations, but it is something where you are consistent and the users understand the information in the quickest possible way. And this is, for example, in regards to using colors in the right way, using um, the, the chart layout in the right way, and a few other details. And I quickly show you in some examples here. So this is um, IBCS's top 10 suggestions for the, uh, the user to consider. So we've already covered the message initially. Um, the second one are titles, which um, we will cover um, a little bit later on. But um, what um, I would like to show you here now is the, the Unify. So the Unify is focused on that um, you make it easy for the user to understand what, you sh what you're showing. And one thing that he, for example, suggests is that when you're using time periods, using vertical bars, and when you're using other details, you're using a horizontal bar display. So the user understands immediately, ah, oh, this is a, a vertical chart, this is a time period, and if it's uh, horizontal, it is, um, something else. Um, the next principle is condense. So what he's suggesting here is to show as much information as possible to give the user the ability to put things in context as opposed to showing you know, one visual on one report, you're allowing the user to get um, an overview of what's going on in in context of the organization. So let me just give you a quick example. So here we see now this is a simple example of a small multiples chart where I show I'm showing the same visual in this case a, a vertical um, bar chart the time period it's vertical um, over time. And, uh, but I can see this as opposed to just having one there, I can see now that this is covering um, different countries and I can put things into perspective. So how um, you know, are we doing in, in the different countries? So this is a typical example of a small multiples charts and these are also now supported with, with Power BI visuals. So check is the next one and 
here I would like to cover again a few examples um, of typical mistakes and unfortunately as we will see Power BI will by default make some of these mistakes where it's uh, coming up with data that shouldn't really be displayed this way which is it's really giving you a, a wrong impression and a wrong result so let's cover the typical issues in this in this space and you know some of them are not relevant in power bi but um, other others are actually really also relevant in power bi as it's making these mistakes by um, by default so what's wrong with this chart here is this a correct display of the of the results so what, what we can see here looks like that Belgium, USA, Switzerland and France are all pretty much the same. So the, the bar length is pretty much the same. Is this correct? No, it isn't. Because this is also something that we see often in newspapers. That the chart does not start at zero. And you know, some people think, oh, you know, this because otherwise it would be so high that it you know it doesn't doesn't fit anymore on the page but this is not um, a little a little nuisance this is actually wrong because so if you're using um, a an axis here that starts at 600 which is it should be somewhere here 600 should be somewhere here then it is just s simply a lie that you um, imply that Belgium and USA you know are having similar results so this is really something that should be avoided and is wrong this is to be honest something that is not so much an issue in in Power BI as uh, you wouldn't easily be able to use axes that don't start at zero so um, should be avoided and this brings us back to the example that we had before where here we're using the same chart scale and have now a proper comparison between these different countries and I'll show you now what's what's happening in, in, in Power BI so this is a, a Power BI chart where I have taken some sales results put them into four horizontal bar charts and this is what Power BI will start out of the box. So we can see here, this is the, the sales per product. This is the sales per sales rep, sales per region and sales per color. So if you look at this, is, is, this, is this correct? So we see here, um, we have a mountain bike that's, that's about six, seven million. And if we compare this to the sales by color, so we have seven here and seven is probably here somewhere here. So it's, it is just not right to compare this, but it gets even worse. So if we look here at our salespeople, so it looks like um, our salesperson pack J has round about the same sales as we do in the Northwest region. But as you can see here, this is completely wrong because the scale here is at 20 million and here it's at 6 million. So in actual fact, Pack J has, has sold a third of what uh, was sold in Northwest. So what the, the impression that the users get here is, is completely wrong and, and something that really should be avoided. And how, how can we do this in Power BI? Yeah, I heard a few a few ideas here. Um, what we can do in Power BI is we can ensure that we are using the same axis endpoint. So what we could do here in this in this case is make sure that the endpoint for this for these charts is always the same, and then we have a proper comparison. Then we can say, okay, Pack J has really only um, a third of the sales in the Northwest region and then this whole thing makes sense but you can see how important it is that when you're using Power BI out of the box 
the results that you get are in actual fact wrong. So very careful here that you are using when, when you have information that should be comparable that you're using on your axis the same endpoint. So I've now used for all these four charts the same endpoint 20 million and then this really makes sense and you can compare the information uh, against each other. Everything else to be honest would be a lie. We have to we have to say it as it is. So let's go back to our uh, success principle. So this was check so make sure that the information is correct. Um, Express we've already covered a little bit so this is the information that so sorry this is the, the principle that you're using the right visualization type for the information at hand. So again there's a few examples here um, how you should communicate information um, and so this is a little bit the, the, the time structure again so um, using the bar charts but then also other things like being consistent with the colors for example black is always solid forecast is hatched and you know one thing that um, all these information design uh, experts typically suggest is not to use pie charts and and why is this because uh, with a pie chart um, you have you make it much harder for the user to compare information because it, it's very hard to, to to compare a slice of a pie as opposed to a bar where you can exactly tell this one is lower than this one in, in, in a pie chart um, it, this would be quite hard. The other thing is also typically with um, with bar charts you can sort them and, and you know go from the, the highest to the lowest as we did if you go back to our uh, power bi chart here so we can see this is the highest one and i can see immediately the highest and, and then it goes down in a, in a pie chart this wouldn't be that easy to 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 sort the information and 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 and, and, and see um you know what what is actually uh, going on here so this was express then we have simplify um, which is about um, avoiding information noise so really maximizing um, the the information that the, the signal to noise ratio so avoid things that just distract your user like background pictures and 3 day 3d charts and so on or, or garnishings of any color of any kind that don't make sense so uh, what what the IBCS principles are postulating is that, for example, when you're using color, and it's not just because you want to fulfill your CD guidelines, but there is a particular meaning behind this this color. So as we've already discussed um, briefly before, um, that uh, when you're using a particular color, and again, color typically should only be used when you really want to. Uh, you know, use a warning or point something out like here you, you, is a negative variance and here this is a positive variance but otherwise uh, as much as possible aim for uh, definitely consistency in the colors um, but also meaning um, with, with the colors that you're using and the final one is structure uh, that's to be honest, not that relevant in the performance management context. This is just making sure that uh, when you're communicating the information is you have a, a structured approach and the the items are mu mutually exhaustive. You're not repeating things, but you, 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 you're clearly structuring the information. But again, if you're interested, please look them up in the IBCS standards. So um, now visualization, I would like to move on a little bit to actual visualization in the, in the performance management context and show you how to realize scorecards and how you can do this in Power BI. So what we have here now is an, is an empty report 
And um, I just quickly want to show you how you can use scorecards in, in Power BI. And so what I'm doing here is I've imported a visual called KPI matrix. So if you go to the Power BI marketplace and search for KPI matrix, you will find this visual here, which I have already added. And this is a great visual to realize scorecards, which is an essential element for performance management. So what we can do here is we have now, you know, different fields that um, we need to populate. And I will do this quickly with a data model here that um, was generated with a carries based on a an accounting system automatically. So let's choose um, a few details here. So I'm using the, the date, which shows the development over time. Uh, then I want to show, in this case, let's say we want to show um, actuals against budget. So the next step is now, so I've put in the the full actuals against the full budget and we see how they develop, but that obviously is not too useful because I'm probably mixing a lot of things that shouldn't be mixed together. So what I need to make sure is that I'm showing specific metrics here, not all actuals against all budget. So, and this is a little bit of a tricky thing that um, when you're using this KPI matrix um, can lead to a little bit of confusion. So, um, what we want to do now, I want to show my metrics here now, and my metrics, um, I'm assuming that um, I want to use the account name. So all my accounts, revenue and expenses are making up the metrics that I actually want to measure here. So I'm going to the account and taking the name. And then the important thing here is, this is a row based metric. So we drag the name to the row based metric name field. And now it will give you all the measures or all the metrics, all the accounts in this case, and show you um, make them a KPI to measure. Obviously there's different requirements, but for the moment, just to show you the, how the KPI matrix works, we're just using um, all the accounts here. Obviously I can filter this um, as um, I need to. So if I only want some of them here, I could just filter them um, just the ones that um, I want to show in my in my balance scorecard. So um, there's one important thing that's missing here. So I can see a little bit the development over time. I can see the actual value, but what would be nice is to see also an indicator um, where I can see at a glance how am I doing. And this can be done using an indicator DAX formula. Oops, sorry, this was the wrong one. Which I have already um, set up here, which is called KPI index. And in the KPI index, just a simple if statement that says if the variance, in this case here, the actual budget variance is greater than 0 0.5, then um, it returns one, which is the indicator for good. If the value is below minus 0 0.5, it is returning three and everything else is neutral, which is two. So um, this formula will, will return one, th three or two. And these are then the indicators that I will see in the scorecard. So let's have a look at how this works. If I drag this one now into the indicator index. I can see now that I get indicator values. So here with the trade sales, we had a budget of 120,000, but we actually only achieved 1500. So this is obviously uh, showing a red light now that we're way below here and the other ones are neutral. So this just as a quick example of how you can realize um, scorecards in Power BI. Let me move on now to a comprehensive application that covers all performance management aspects. And so what we see here now is an initial sample dashboard and what uh, is covered here are typical 
IBCS guidelines. So green is always a revenue, brown are expenses. Um, the light color here is my budget. That's always in this light green color. And then yellow is the forecast. That's always also consistently used. Um, but what we're doing here is we also have a few special things and those are just general information design guidelines that I quickly want to cover here. And what we recommend is using custom tooltips. And I'll show you a little bit what we're doing here. So here we have sales results where I can see how have my salespeople performed in the respective period. And I can already see by the color um, if they're performing well or not so well. So dark green means they perform well and the redder it is, the worse are they performing. So if I look now here at my top performer and move the mouse pointer to this um, bar chart, I can see now um, what is driving the positive performance and what is driving the negative results. So I can see this person here is doing very well in the mountain range in Europe where he's 8,200% above budget. So he only had 800 budgeted, but he sold 70,000. Then, so this is sorted. So the best um, uh, result here um, where we have the most positive variances at the top and then the worst ones are at the bottom. So if you look at the bottom, uh, we see the road um, category here. Um, this sales rep is below his budget, but only by 12%. And so at a glance, without doing any slicing and dicing and drill down and drill through, I can immediately see what's going on. And the same thing also for the others. So if I want to see why is this rep doing so badly, then I can see how he has uh, problems in, in the road range in North America, where he is significantly below his budget. So this just as a general tip of how you can use tooltips effectively and, and the tooltip in the end is just uh, another table um, which you break down by the details that are driving typically uh, these results and so here I'm using the product line the product name the date the sales territory actual and budget the absolute variance and the relative variance and of course the most interesting thing is the absolute variance so I'm, I'm sorting here by the absolute variance and showing the biggest ones, the most positive ones first and the negative ones at the bottom. And then I'm just setting up this as the custom tooltip for this chart. So if, if we look here at the definition of this of this chart, we can see the tooltip here is using power search sales. We call this power search at the search what is driving the performance of a sales rep is here at the bottom. So this is still all standard Power BI functionality. What's a little bit different here is this Actarius comment um, visual, which allows you to collect unstructured information. So this is something um, that just Actarius gives you to enter rich text information here to your results that are driven by, by filters. So that is, that is probably something that you haven't seen before. But let's move on now and, and look at um, more detailed um, aspect and here I would like to cover now a little bit of, of planning and so with, with the planning um, we I would like to initially start with typical HR planning examples what we see here is a is a, is a report so what we see here is a HR planning data collection form or data entry form. So here we can see now a Power Apps visual. So this is um, a, a Power Apps application um, that um, I have created here that allows you to, that's linked to a table that contains all your employees. So here in this case, this is automatically generated by Ectaris, but again, this could be any relational table that you have in your organization. And then um, what we are showing here is a list of this table, so the name um, of, the, of the employee, the role, the hire date, the hours per week that uh, they work, the base rate, the monthly salary. These records can be, anal can be edited in Power Apps 
uh, with standard Power Apps functionality. So I can click now on a employee and say for this employee, um, they will get a raise, maybe not to 890, but to 90. And they will also work a little bit more, so they will work full time now. And then I put in the, the date for this. And this is um, cool Power Apps functionality. It allows you to do form based editing of, of your data. So if I'm finished here, I can write this back and then I have the full Power BI functionality available to me that I can immediately see, okay, what's the effect of this change? Um, how does this affect um, my uh, results um, with, with all the Power BI power? So this was form-based planning. Um, I would like to move on now to a bit more comprehensive options. So what we see here now is an income statement planning data entry form with a few different visuals. Um, we see here at the bottom three visuals based on Power Apps. So this is for expense details. So we'll see a bit later on how this works. So you can either do your planning here for a particular account or you can break it down to particular items that make up the value here. This is the comment visual that we've already briefly discussed before where the users can add comments to the uh, results that are driven by the filters. So these are um, filter comments that are driven by the filters, not report comments. So in, in the new Power BI versions, you're now able to use report comments, but they are uh, generic based, or they are global based on the report. Here, these comments are specific and driven by the filters. So I can see exactly what are the comments for 2018 uh, first quarter. And here we have uh, another Power Apps visual that allows us to manage the workflow. But let's look at this a little bit later. So the main visual here is the Actaris matrix. So the Actaris matrix comes in two flavors. There's a free version, which uh, allows you to do um, matrixes, um, has a few interesting matrix features, like for example, selective drill down. So if you click here on the cost of sales, it will only expand the cost of sales and not the entire um, rows here as at the moment the, the normal Power BI visual works. So, um, but the most interesting thing is the write back functionality that is only available in the full Actaris version. So what I can do here now um, as the user, I could for example start with saying, yeah, this is okay, but I would like to see, you know, what did we have last year? And here we have now the full Power BI power available to us. So if you want to modify this report, it is very simple. So here we have a, the previous year actuals, um, and we could use that to give us a bit of um, an idea of, you know, what are the the budget figures that, you know, I should plan for here. And I can just take this and drag it into my values. And now this matrix will automatically uh, adjust. It will show me my, my budget numbers against the prior year actuals. So a, a great way to help me do my budget. So here you can see now, these are the budget values that we that we already entered. And these are the, the numbers in the previous year. We can see here now, we're actually doing pretty well. We have, we have high expectations and high hopes for next year. We're planning to increase our revenue a lot, but obviously this is demo data. So this is probably not what we'll see in reality. Um, and this is obviously also again driven by filters. So if you want to plan other scenarios, um, you could just select them here. So let's um, have a look now and say we had, um, if we look at the details, we're doing the drill down again, we see we had $456,000 standard cost of sales. So let's assume this year we have 500,000. And as you can see, the users can now type in their number and they will automatically this will be automatically aggregated. Let's do another one. So returns and adjustments. We had 33,000 last year. So let's say this year we have 40,000. 
and now we've entered um, our numbers here. Um, the interesting thing is now that everything here happens in real time. So I can immediately see now the total of our budget is 460,000. So um, what I could do now is I could submit this budget to my manager um, using this Power Apps app. And this, this, this is a simple Power Apps app that depending on the, the button here will um, set workflow status. So in this case, if I press submit here, what will happen is it will lock my ability to write data here. This is in this case using a carries write back write. So it will take away my right to change anything here. And it will send an email to my boss saying Martin has just submitted his budget numbers. So if I get this email now, I can then look at the numbers here and I'm getting the same report. But I have the option now to also do top-down changes. So you can do your, your budget bottom-up or top-down. So I can see now so at the moment a total of 460,000 where I think this is unrealistic. Um, we have way higher revenues. So this needs to be higher. I want here $600,000 of um, cost of sales. So I just type in the number now. So this looked fairly simple. You just you know, the, this entry and it's immediately showing. But what has happened in the background is that this had to be applied across the entire data model. So across all the accounts, across, you know, I've selected here a quarter, so it has to do these things across time hierarchies. I've got multiple cost centers here, so I've done my budget for all cost centers. But I have a lot of cost centers here, so this had to be broken down across all the cost centers. So what has happened is that it's broken down this value now and we, according to the existing distribution. So we distributed now an increase here, which is fairly low because this is a smaller number and much more. So the, um, the difference to our previous value has gone mostly to the standard cost of sales. And so this is just to demonstrate the capabilities in the Actaris matrix that you can do bottom up and top down planning. So we could also do a relative increase here and saying, hey, I want to increase this by 10%. And now we've done the relative increase. And again, that would be broken down to the detail level. So this just as a simple example of the workflow, just that you see a little bit um, what we're doing here. So we have this Power Apps app that manages the work workflow status. So it will depending um, on the on the button that's pressed here, which is submit, approve or reject. So at the moment we're here in the initial submit stage, so we haven't submitted it yet. But if I press submit here, my budget will be now submitted. It will lock my option to change anything here. It will send an email to the manager and they can then decide to either approve or reject it. So just to show you a little bit what's going on here. What we're using here is actually a, a simple flow where say from the power apps that we're using on, on our report. We, are, we have three options. So depending on what has happened here, then if, if I do submit button, then do this. If the approve button is pressed, then do this. And if the reject button is pressed, then do this. So this is a very simple flow. It's a bit of a thing here to convert everything to, to uh, the UTC time zone. But otherwise, what is done here is just managing the, the email workflow that it sends the, an email to the admin for approval and an email to the user that the budget, the confirmation that this budget was submitted. And this is um, what we are now using here. Um, so this is the, the combination of Power Apps and, and Flow. And like this, in, in this example here, we have now realized all the typical planning aspects from sales planning to HR, which we have already seen, to CapEx planning, financing, 
down to the cash flow. So in the end, everything comes together in the cash flow and based on my assumptions here in the different areas, I can immediately see um, what is going on. Will I be able to afford this? Will I have enough cash? And I can see in our case, we're doing, we're doing pretty well. So this green line is our balance, our cash balance, and it stays positive until the end of the period. So we don't have to worry. In case we have issues here, there's also an option here to manage your debt instruments. Um, if I see that um, I'm running out of cash, then I can either increase my sales, reduce my cost, as we've done just before, or add financing instruments. And this is again, just the power apps, power app um, where I can manage now loans. So here I can put in my loan, the start date, the duration, the interest rate, in what periods I repaid and the actual amount. And again, this will then affect the cash flow, and I can see already what's what what are the loans and finance instruments that are planned here. So a, a great way to use Power Apps and turn Power BI into a full enterprise and performance management system. So this just as a quick um, demonstration. Are there any questions now that um, you have? around the topics discussed so far. So we have one question. Um, this gentleman here wants to know, is this data model accessible in other applications? And the answer is yes. So I can show you a quick example here. So here we have the, the same data model that we're using, but in Excel. So um, we can either use directly the Power BI model using the Analyze in Excel functionality. So you have all your semantic models directly defined in Power BI. Or it could also be um, a semantic model outside of Power BI. For example, this could be an Actarius model, which is the case here. It was automatically generated from your um, accounting systems. And with Actarius, you can then also do, it will automatically get do this again so we can enter now here um, a number and do this directly from the from the pivot table and if we finished we just press commit and this will update the data model in the background so yes it is possible this data model is accessible from other from other applications so actually any application um, that um, can access a relational database or a analysis services model. So there's a question now, how easy is it to adapt the data model? So it depends. So you you obviously have all the options that you have in, in, in Power BI. Um, you have, you know, simple write back tables here. Uh, these are, to be honest, typically mostly relevant for simple requirements. If you want to specify a simple lookup table for more complex typical budgeting or planning scenarios, I wouldn't recommend them. So in that case, you better use Power Apps or Actaris. With Actaris, you have the option to directly, the business users have the option to directly modify their data models. So what I can do here is I can go into the table or in the, into the dimension and say I would like to have a new scenario here. Um, I want to have the forecast two and just save this. And now if I switch back to my Power BI model and press refresh, um, we will see that this scenario is then automatically refreshed here. So we see now the forecast two is not here and I could not do immediately my planning for the forecast two scenario. Um, so uh, quite easy then to modify the data models. Uh, another question here is how, how long does it take to implement something like this? Um, that obviously varies um, depending on the requirements, but we really believe, and we have done this now for the last 20 years, at the moment there is no quicker and more effective way there to realize more sophisticated planning applications. Um, 
even if you buy very expensive products to adapt them to your requirement, which is always necessary, will typically take longer than if you do it here in Power BI. And then even you don't have the power of, of Power BI. So all the visualization options, the interactivity between um, uh, the objects here. Um, so yeah, an extremely powerful new way of realizing performance management applications. And you know, if you want to have a specific answer, so we have clients that take a few days. So they have simple requirements that can be realized in a few days. Um, others, obviously, where this takes longer, if you have more complex requirements, global groups, multi-currency, complex statutory consolidation, and this takes longer. But on average, um, typically, we stay from start to finish uh, in the one month range. And then typically our clients just build and maintain the solution themselves. Because as you saw, the only thing that you need to know is um, Power BI. It's good to have um, a bit of an idea about modeling with the carries, even that is taken care of because the models are automatically created. So, so this concludes my session. Thank you very much for attending. Um, if you like further information um, for the around the information design side of things, please um, check out um, IBCS and, and Edward Tufty, quite valuable um, resources for information design. If you are interested in comprehensive performance management and planning information tips and tricks, please check out our website managility.co and our blog. And if you're interested in further information about Ectaris, here are the offices, um, our offices around the globe, um, our Asia Pacific headquarter here in Sydney, our YES headquarter in Chicago, and then the, uh, the European and South American operations. Um, the Facebook site is Ectaris, facebook.com Ectaris. Our Twitter is Ectaris FPA, Financial Planning and Analytics, and our website is at ectaris.com. Thank you very much for spending some time with me. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me on LinkedIn, Martin Kratke, or send me an email to my email address, martin at ectaris.com or martink at Thank you very much.